Wir informieren Sie hier täglich zur Situation rund um die Corona-Krise in Österreich. Herzlich willkommen zu Ihrer Krone News Sondersendung am Mittwoch, den 8. April. Zunächst zu den Zahlen. In Österreich sind mit Stand Mittwoch 10 Uhr 12.840 Menschen positiv auf das Coronavirus getestet worden. Rund 4.500 von ihnen gelten mittlerweile aber wieder als genesen. Die Zahl der Todesfälle steigt allerdings leider auch deutlich weiter. Mittlerweile sind 277 Personen, die an Covid-19 erkrankt waren, gestorben. Auch die Zahl der Intensivpatienten steigt. Derzeit werden knapp 1.100 Covid-19-Patienten im Krankenhaus behandelt. 267 von ihnen liegen auf der Intensivstation. Heute hat Bildungsminister Heinz Fassmann bei einer Pressekonferenz den Plan für die nächsten Wochen präsentiert. Ab 4. Mai startet für die Abschlussklassen eine dreiwöchige Vorbereitungszeit an den Schulen unter Einhaltung der Hygienebedingungen. Die Maturanten schreiben ab 25. Mai in nur drei Fächern die Zentralmatura. In die Note fließt auch das Abschlusszeugnis der letzten Klasse mit ein. Die mündliche Matura entfällt. In diesen Fächern ist die Note der Abschlussklasse auch gleich die Maturanote. Schüler können sich aber freiwillig per Prüfung verbessern. Der Tourismus darf ab Mitte Mai auch auf eine langsame Normalisierung hoffen. Gastronomie, Hotellerie und die Freizeitwirtschaft sollen dann stufenweise wieder hochgefahren werden. Das genaue Vorgehen soll feststehen, wenn Ende des Monats die Corona-Krankheitszahlen feststehen. In Sachen Reisefreiheit hingegen sind wir vom Normalzustand noch weit entfernt. Außenminister Alexander Schallenberg hat am Mittwoch betont, die volle Reisefreiheit würde es erst wiedergeben, wenn das Virus global besiegt ist. Es wurden heute außerdem sieben Länder neu auf die Liste der vollen Reisewarnungen gesetzt. Das sind Belgien, Portugal, Schweden, Brasilien, Indonesien, Nigeria und die Philippinen. Damit sind es insgesamt 24 Staaten, die als besonders gefährlich gelten. Tourismusministerin Elisabeth Köstinger hat dazu aufgerufen, heuer Urlaub in Österreich zu machen. Morgen gibt es noch einen Rückholungsflug aus Neuseeland. Danach ist die intensive Phase der Rückholungen vorbei. Derzeit sind noch rund 1000 Österreicher mit Rückkehrwunsch im Ausland. Während Österreich bereits über die Zeit danach spricht, ist in den USA, teils auch aufgrund von politischem Versagen, die sprichwortliche Hölle los. New York City ist besonders betroffen. Dazu habe ich mit einem Notarzt vor Ort Video telefoniert. You know, after reading all of the reports coming out of New York City, um, what's it like to be an ER doctor right now there? It's like a soldier in the trenches of war where you don't know what you're going to expect going in. Uh, before this pandemic, it was like being a bartender where you don't know what it's like going in. You're behind a bar. You're taking care of the same kind of patient population. You got to move as fast as possible. You want to make sure that the building doesn't collapse on you. Uh, with the overwhelming volume of people that come in. But now it's we're liking it to wartime efforts where it's now going to war where your your life is at danger, at high risk of exposure. I've had many colleagues of mine that I've covered for and uh, substitute shifts for as a per diem because they are hospitalized. So uh, that's, that hasn't happened before ever to mm -hmm. this degree. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore it's this constant fear, but also this courage that comes after the fear that You know, if we don't go in, then who else is? And, and if we don't go in, the system will collapse and more patients are going to get sicker. And this is not going to correct itself until, you know, you have enough of us to fight this back. How many hours are you and your colleagues working? I mean, what does your typical day look like at the moment? So I can represent what they are going through because my most of my colleagues are full time. Most doctors are full time doctors who they're they are uh, committed to one institution and one emergency room for the last five, 10, 15 years years and they have a certain number of hours that they have to do. I think it's around an average of 32 hours to 40 hours a week. Uh, and it could be daytime, nighttime. As a per diem doctor, what I've done is I get to choose whenever and wherever I work. So I could totally sit out this entire pandemic for two months and not work and be fine and then work afterwards. But the opposite has happened. Ironically, I've actually went in 23 times the last 27 days in over a dozen emergency rooms in New York City. Uh, and I've completely lost count. Everything's a blur. And I work about 10 to 12 hour shifts at least, um, giving myself enough time to recharge and rest. But it's becoming more, twice more than the average physician 
uh, fighting this pandemic. And not to saying that I'm better than or I'm entitled to this, you know, more respect or anything. It's more because I'm trying to fill in the holes that are created by my colleagues who are texting me. I am sick or I am hospitalized. I know that, you know, you can cover if you can. Can you? And who am I to say no to that? I'm responding to a call. I am heeding a calling. So uh, it's just been a surprise to all of us and myself. How are you feeling mentally? I mean, it must be incredibly taxing to see people in such critical condition all day long. I've seen days like this before during my training in New York City uh, and as well as during my work as an attending. It's once every two to three weeks, however, days like these where people are so critically ill or people are dying at an alarming rate, uh, once every uh, once in a blue moon. I don't see this happening every day. So it's not giving a lot of us enough time to recharge and it's not even giving the hospital systems enough time to regroup and find enough beds or you know, clean enough equipment or prepare the equipment for the next you know, pe- um, surge capacity event such as a mass shooting or, you know, an influenza outbreak. So for us, having this happen every day, every minute, and gets progressively worse than the day it was before for the last three to four weeks, because that's what a pandemic does, is exhausting. And for our mental health, we need to take time to, you know, focus on ourselves as well. We can't pour from an empty cup. However, you're talking to a group of, uh, a community of physicians where the, that we were we have been struggling with mental health problems even before this pandemic. Our suicide rate was twice the national average even before this pandemic came around. So a lot of us do struggle with trying to put ourselves before our patients. In fact, we swore an oath to put our patients before ourselves. So it's very problematic where I have not only been thinking about the present danger of this pandemic, but worrying that this is just the beginning What happens after the pandemic to our mental health and how we recharge when we feel that we've been abandoned, we were not adequately prepared, we don't feel safe going to work, and the system didn't adequately protect us. I'm not trying to blame anyone, but the institution of not supporting us in terms of our mental health even before this pandemic, the protective equipment during this pandemic, and also the concern for what happens after this pandemic where if we're going to be thrown back under the bus and be forgotten again. Um, you said that you you and your colleagues sometimes didn't feel safe and you've talked about protective equipment. We know that in Austria there have been shortages of masks, of protective gear to ensure that um, each and every health worker that goes into work is fully protected. What is the situation like with that over there? Like how bad is – how how severe is the lack? It's the same thing everywhere. We're, and this is a global issue. Are we protecting our frontline health care workers? It's like sending our soldiers into war – asking them to fight this fight, but then realizing that you're depending on them to get their own equipment and helmets. Is it correct? Is it right or wrong? Who's defining what is right or wrong? It's up to your ethical judgment if this is this is correct or not. And to me, it doesn't feel right. And for myself, the personal protective equipment has been so bad that I'm now, as a per diem, feeling protected only because, as a per diem doctor, I have the unique, unfortunate advantage that have access to different emergency rooms. So I have created my own personal protective equipment that I cobbled together like Iron Man, where I have one thing from different emergency rooms. The first thing I hear from every shift, the first five minutes is like, oh my God, where did you get that? That looks so nice. And it's usually hospital X, Y, or Z. Then I have even better equipment because I pleaded on my social media for more equipment from whoever is responsible for this because I, I'm just a mercenary who I don't know who's responsible. Just get us more protective equipment. And it now is relying on per, I'm relying on personal and private donations from my friends and family who are now I'm wearing adequate P100 masks with goggles and a face shield and a head to toe uh, chemical hazmat suit. Uh, now I'm adequately prepared, but I had to rely on personal donations, which I'm to which I'm very grateful for, but why did it have to be this way? Why did I have to rely on personal donations where it should be coming from someone else? That's how I see it. Some other people might feel that we're being entitled or we're asking for too much, but then if we get sick and we're not adequately protected and we die or we're critically injured or disabled, right? who's gonna be around in the future to take care of you when it's your turn to get sick. So I don't. I certainly don't think that anyone thinks um, health workers are being entitled if they ask for appropriate um, protection. But how bad is it? Like, are your colleagues getting one mask, say, per per three days, or or how is it? Or do are there are there 
half the number of masks that you need, 10% of the number? Like, can you give me, can you sort of pour that into numbers a little bit? First of all, one mask for three days sounds like such a luxury. I don't know where <laughs> you're getting three, one mask for three days. That sounds amazing. I wore the same mask for nine days as the lead physician in some emergency rooms. So I've seen lines of nurses lining out at offices for their one mask a week or one mask a day ration. Uh, masks are not, N95 masks, by the way, are does, in the label, it's supposed to be swapped out between patient encounters. After you see one patient and have one encounter, you're supposed to throw away that N95 and replace it with another to prevent infectious and risk and exposure. Obviously, that's not practical. Number one, that we don't have enough. Number two, it's dangerous too because you, every time you're touching the mask and removing it, you're inhaling the air of COVID-19. There's no safe place to switch it out. So it might be better to keep the same mask on for the whole day until your shift is over. But that's not what the N95s are designed for. And that, and not, so going back to the first point, we don't have enough. So people are wearing the same mask for one week or, or nine days in my uh, experience, or you wear the surgical mask over the N95 to keep it for longer. People are texting me about how they're putting in them in ovens, which creates a fire hazard risk. Um, 70 degrees Celsius for at least 30 minutes has been the recommendation. Some people are putting masks in their microwave. Uh, it's, it's, we're innovating, but we're innovating from a, a point of desperation and that's the state we're in. I now have a P100 mask. A 100 in the P100 means it filters out 99.97%, nearly 100% of particles. And N95 only filters out 95% of particles greater than 0.3 microns. Viruses are only 0.001 to 0.04 microns. It's not even that perfect. I don't want to take a 5% risk, even if micro virus is even that big. So we're, we're not adequately protected. We need a PAPR. Forget P100, forget N95s. What we really need, everyone's like talking about these masks and it's like preparing for medieval warfare when we're supposed to be in the 21st, 22nd century warfare. We need a PAPR, a positive air purifying respirator that covers our whole head without the need for goggles and mask and fitting and anything. It's this thing that's like a spacesuit. However, it's expensive, but it's up to you to decide whether our lives are worth that expense. Uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio has said that New York City has enough medical supplies to last until about Tuesday or Wednesday this week. Um, specifically, there are likely over a thousand ventilators missing in the city. What happens after that? If you go to the New York State Department of Health website, it's public document. The ventilator allocation guidelines published in November 2015, revised from November 2007. It's public. Any of you can go Google it right now. On page 18, it says that they projected back in November 2015, if we ever had a pandemic on the level of the 1918 Spanish flu, you would need 90,000 ventilators, 90,000 ventilators in a six week period. We are at the level of a 1918 Spanish flu. They also estimated on the same page, page 18 out of 242 pages, we only have 10,000 ventilators, including the ones in stockpile, which takes time to inventorize and deliver to a hospital. 10,000, that leaves 80,000 people who would need them that would be left to die unnecessarily. And the whole document isn't about how to get more ventilators. The whole document is how to decide who to live and who to die. What are the standards, what are the ethical standards of deciding or making such decisions? So with the numbers are not adding up. 1,000 more, 600 more, 300 more, whatever the numbers I'm hearing on the, in the news, 30,000 more is the, lar the largest number. You add all that up, it's still leaving 50,000 people missing a ventilator. That's one in two will die unnecessarily. So I'm not in that business of trying to figure out how to get these ventilators. Again, I'm just a mercenary grunt in the trenches. I just need a ventilator if you need a ventilator or try my best to make sure you don't have to have a ventilator. Can I bridge you far enough and long enough so we can flatten the curve so that by the time a ventilator is available, uh, you're ready for one? Thinking of obviously ventilators and protective equipment, but also thinking of um, wider measures such as stay at home, um, shelter, shelter in place orders. Um, how happy are you with the level of political support um, that the medical system in the US has been getting both on a state level and on a federal level? So it's, again, I'm a grunt in the trenches as a mercenary. I know people who served in the military, you would ask them in a wartime effort, what do you think about the political effort? And then most of them will tell you, I don't give a shit about the politics. I don't care why I'm going to war. I don't know why I'm being sent to war. I don't care about what, it's Vietnam, World War II, whatever. I'm fighting for my country, number one. And number two, I also fight for the people next to me, my colleagues. And that's my same attitude. You're not, people are not paying me enough to care about the politics up above. 
I see a problem. I see a pandemic. I see people dying. I see I have open shifts and days off. I'm going to go in almost every day of the last 27 days. I've got it until I'm completely burnt out with moral injury, realizing that my colleagues are still dying. I'm going in for them and I've intubated my own nurses. I definitely have, have known of colleagues of mine that I worked with who are now dead or on life support. And I'm going back in because of them, right? Because if no one's filling their holes that they're leaving behind for these shifts, the emergency rooms will collapse without doctors, without nurses. There just needs to be someone there to fight, fight that back this tide of more and more patients are gonna keep coming in with COVID-19. And if I'm not around to take care of them, it's representative of the whole system not having enough doctors to be able to take care of you who's watching right now when it's your turn to get sick. Yeah. Um, on Sunday, the number of deaths um, in New York City in 24 hours for the first time went down since the whole pandemic started. Um, do you think that's just a fluke or is there like a small light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. So in just data and biostatistics, you can never take one point in time as indicative of anything great. I think it's encouraging. And, you know, I like to hold on to that. But, you know, human beings have been horrible at predicting the future. Like things like the stock market, like we all be killing it right now. We've all been good at predicting the future. So one point in the stock market does not mean that there's a trend that we're heading towards greener pastures. One point in the stock market means that we can crash the next day. So same with this, like it's encouraging. I like to hope for the best, but prepare. If you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And if we let our guard down, then we're gonna, we're all gonna die. I have one last question for you, Calvin. Um, when you leave the hospital, when you when you finish your shift, what's the mood like on the streets of New York? Because I mean, like having a military hospital ship um, docked near the city must sort of be quite, you know, disquieting and quite um, weird. Like it must give a weird feeling to the city. And also, I imagine the streets are empty and everything. So, how does it feel to be outside in New York right now? Of course, the military thing, if anything, if people violated the social distancing by coming out in crowds to take photos of it. So that was the mood. So everyone was really excited. Right. Number two about the ship, it's a zombie movie in the making. They're saying they're not going to take any COVID-19 patients. They're non-COVID-19 only because the ship can't handle infectious control. And the last time we had COVID-19 in a ship, it did not end well. Right. COVID-19 in a ship is a disaster. But the first day they accidentally accepted COVID-19 patients. Right. And how can you ensure non-COVID-19 patients on a ship if the tests are only 70 percent sensitive? That's a, that means a 30 percent chance that test that a negative result is inaccurate. That's what a 70 percent sensitive test means. So you could be a lucky one, get 30 percent, 30 percent, 30 percent, 30 percent and still have COVID-19. Do you still go on board the ship? Do you wait three, four days for that ship? So, of course, the mood in New York has been very one of questioning, just like, is it really a good idea to bring this ship on board? It's like a zombie movie in the making, especially with patients. 50% of us may not have symptoms and still have COVID-19. All you need is one person, a sailor, to get back on board the ship having gotten COVID-19 by exploring New York just by the city block or touching a door handle and then coming back on the ship and give it to other people. It's That's our attitude, just like really, like it's a great symbol, but we, we, we question things. Us as New Yorkers, we're, I was, I'm a born and raised New Yorker. I'm a rebel, I question everything, right? You tell me to stay at home, you know, even as a doctor, I'd be like, why? I mean, I'm gonna do it because public health. But like that's our innate nature. So the mood is right now when I go back home, right? Other than the seven o'clock uh, applause for the healthcare workers, which makes me tear up every time. So I do appreciate that. It's very supportive. That's like New York after 9/11. We all come together. Other than that, every other moment of the day, it's like a Sunday morning in New York. I see so many people still outside. At least in the areas where I live, right in Manhattan, I still see people outside. Some with masks, some not. And it just feels like a Sunday morning in Manhattan. Yes, it's a little, it's a little less crowded. It's, I'm not in, I don't live in Times Square, so I can't imagine being in a ghost town. But where I live, it's just, you know, people going to the park, social distancing, but it's as if like there's no pandemic. No one's really, it's not like a complete lockdown where the cities are, where the city's completely deserted. Calvin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me out of your busy schedule. And thank you so much for all the work that you do. Good luck for the upcoming weeks. Auch das Europabüro der Weltgesundheitsorganisation WHO warnt vor einer frühzeitigen Lockerung der Maßnahmen. Wachsendes Wissen über Covid-19 und positive Entwicklungen in einigen Staaten würden noch lange nicht bedeuten, dass man das Virus besiegt habe, so die WHO. Vielmehr biete es die Chance, den Erreger besser in den Griff zu bekommen. Aber es sei noch ein langer Weg und der Kampf müsse auch international besser abgestimmt werden. Neben Nerven und Energie kostet die Krisenbewältigung vor allem auch Geld und das gar nicht so wenig. 
Das Finanzministerium will das Parlament und die Öffentlichkeit künftig monatlich über die Kosten der Corona-Krise informieren. Das hat ein Sprecher des Ministeriums angekündigt. Die Hilfsmaßnahmen könnten inklusive Kurzarbeit bis zu 41 Milliarden Euro kosten. Das sind gut 10 Prozent der gesamten heuer erwarteten Wirtschaftsleistung. Vizekanzler Werner Kogler hat mit einem Vorstoß zum Thema überrascht. Er möchte, um die Kosten der Corona-Krise zu finanzieren, eine Erbschaftssteuer für Millionäre einführen. Heftige Kritik kommt von der FPÖ und dem Haus- und Grundbesitzerbund. Zustimmung gibt es natürlich von der SPÖ. Der Koalitionspartner ist vorsichtig verwundert. Das türkise Finanzministerium kommentiert den Vorstoß nicht. Die ÖVP betont, es brauche einen nationalen Kraftakt und nicht irgendwelche Einzelmaßnahmen. Und wie die EU finanzielle Unterstützung liefern will, ist noch unklar. Die EU-Finanzminister haben sich nicht auf Hilfen für finanziell schwächere Länder einigen können. Die Beratungen wurden auf Donnerstag vertagt. Seit Dienstagnachmittag hatten die Finanzminister in einer Videokonferenz versucht, auf ein grünes Blatt zu kommen. Gestritten wird vor allem über gemeinsame Anleihen, die sogenannten Eurobonds. Es wurden allerdings bereits Milliarden aus dem EU-Budget mobilisiert und die Europäische Zentralbank hat ein riesiges Anleihekaufprogramm gestartet. Wie jetzt noch einmal nachgelegt werden soll, da sind sich die Mitgliedstaaten noch uneinig. Das waren die wichtigsten Meldungen für den 8. April. Wir halten Sie hier und auf krone.at selbstverständlich weiterhin am Laufenden. Bitte bleiben Sie weiterhin zu Hause und gesund. Ich freue mich, dass Sie zusehen. Musik